throughout history. Uh, being Greek, I like to look at some of my people. One, two people stand out, but one was Greek, and one name was Socrates. Have you guys heard of Socrates? Okay. Socrates was this guy that would go around Athens and he would ask questions. He would basically ask questions to say, well, why do you believe that? Uh, it's known as the Socratic method. It's, it's kind of a, okay, what do you believe? And you would say what you believe, and then he would go, well, why do you believe that? And I guess the equivalent would be uh, my son. When he was a toddler, we would be watching television together, and it would be time for him to go to bed. And I would say, hey, buddy, it's time to go to bed. And he would look at me and he would say, why? Well, it's because it's getting late and, you know, we usually go to bed at this time. But why? Because at, if you go to bed now, when you wake up in the morning, you're not going to be as cranky and you're going to start off and have a good day. Why? You know what, Corbin? It's just time to go to bed because I said so. That's why. <laughs> now, that's what was happening in Athens, but on a, a greater scale. So the things they believed about the gods and the things they believed about democracy and life, uh, Socrates would take students with him and, and he would say, hey, whenever somebody asks you what you believe, Ask them why they believe it and probe deeper and deeper and deeper. And so Socrates is known as kind of the founder of philosophy. But it didn't set well with those that were in government because they felt like he was questioning their gods and he was corrupting the youth. So they basically got together. They had this trial and 280 people voted that Socrates was guilty. 220 said he wasn't. So then they had to figure out, like, what was going to be his punishment. And the council recommended death. But interestingly, they went up to Socrates and they said, well, this is what we suggest. Do you have another suggestion? And so Socrates said this. He's like, I suggest a wage be paid to me by the government and free dinners for the rest of my life. Well, guess what the council chose? Death, right? He, he died uh, by hemlock, poisonous hemlock. And so uh, that was Socrates. There was a Christian who was a bishop of Smyrna uh, back in the second century. His name was Polycarp. And Polycarp was interesting because um, he was so dedicated to Jesus that when he was told by the Roman proconsul to recant his faith and to burn incense to the emperor, he was told, if you do not do this, you will be burned to the stake. And this is how Polycarp responded to that. He said, 80 and six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? You threaten me with fire that burns for a season, and after a little while it is quenched. But you are ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment that is prepared for the wicked. But why do you delay? Come, do what you will. Is that powerful? Like these men are brave, right? They, they believe in their cause, and they're willing to die, right? So I look at those passages, and I, I think, man, brave. But there's a different tone when Jesus is about to die. There's a different mood. There isn't that, 
I'm going to die. you got to feed me for the rest of my life. But there's a somber tone. And so as we look at this story about the death of Jesus, you know, you, you see crucifixes. You see uh, pictures of Jesus on the cross because the death of Christ is a significant event. It says the setting. It says, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So just to kind of set this up right, the sixth hour is 12 p.m. It's noon. It's lunch. It shouldn't be dark. So as you, as you look at this story here, there are like kind of like three miracles that are taking place here, right? And, and then the ninth hour is what time? 3 p.m. So from 12 to 3 p.m., there is absolute darkness over the whole land. Some people have said, well, you know, this must be like a natural disaster. Maybe it's a bunch of locusts. Maybe it's a storm. Some people have said that it, maybe it's an eclipse. The problem with that eclipse theory is that this happened right around the time of the Passover. And so the Passover is always done on a full moon. There's also a timing issue, right? Because a, a normal eclipse probably takes about seven minutes, right? It's recorded here that for three hours, darkness came across the whole land. And what's being communicated here is that this is a supernatural darkness, this is a self-imposed darkness by God the Father because Jesus is sitting on the cross, right? Jesus is known throughout history, throughout the scriptures. John talks about it. He's, he's the light that is in a dark world. And so Jesus hanging on this cross here is like a flickering candle that's about to be extinguished and it's embodied by the physical darkness of that land. Darkness. It says there, it says, and at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice. Eloi, Eloi, lemma samachtini. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We know that passage, right? We, we know that language, that language is this idea that God is on the cross, Jesus is on the cross, and he's crying out to the Father. But the interesting thing about this passage is he's not calling God Father. And this is rare, right? Because you don't find passages where Jesus refers to his Father as God. It's because something else is going on here besides Jesus in pain and agony. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but he's actually quoting a psalm. So he's on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as he's on the cross, he feels separated. That personal pronoun, my. You know, I, I have a nine-year-old son and Sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm with him, I'm sitting on the couch, and, and I just can't help but hug him and kiss him on top of the head. And I look at him affectionately and I say, my tragal age, my tragal age. No one calls him tragal age, but his father, right? Right? There's a, there's a special, there's an intimacy there, right? And so when we think about Jesus, he's saying, my God. There, there's a personal, intimate element that's there, right? Think about the people in your life that are closest to you. Have you ever said, you know, my son or my wife? There's a sense of ownership there, right? And what's significant about that is who are the people that will hurt you the most. It is the people that are closest to you. If there's a sever in a relationship between your children or your spouse, 
your parents. There's a pain like you don't normally feel. And so Jesus is not only experiencing the physical pain that Polycarp would have experienced, but he's also experiencing this relational pain, this strain, because the person that he's the most intimate with, he feels separated from. He feels like he's not there, and he's in pain emotionally, physically, And the darkness communicates that tone right there, that what's going on. And he says, why have you forsaken me? Have you guys ever in your life felt forsaken by God? Has there been a time where you've been praying for something and you feel like he doesn't hear you, he doesn't listen? Has there been a time where you're going through hardships in life and and though you pray and you pray, there seems to be no answer? Like Jesus is on the cross here and he's quoting this psalm and he feels what? He feels separated from God. He feels forsaken, right? And I was talking about this in first service. Sometimes when we think of like hell, we often think about the, the literal imagery, right? We take the imagery very literally, and it talks about like the unquenchable fire or the smoldering smoke or the gnashing of teeth, the lake of fire. But see, Jesus is on the cross. He shows us a different kind of way to think about hell in the sense of He feels separated from God. Because ultimately, however you define hell, it's a separation from God. It's a separation from his goodness. Because James says in James 1.17 that that God is, everything that's good is from God. And so imagine a place that you're separated from God. There's no trace of goodness there. No love, no joy, no peace, no care, no relationship, no unity, no peace. But that's not God's desire. God's desire, he talks about it in Peter, is that no man should perish, but he, that they would come to repentance. But there are some people that don't want to have anything to do with God. And in a sense, this is a place where they get what they have always wanted. But it's not going to be great as they think. It's going to be void of goodness, right? And so you're just painting this picture of this setting here, this darkness, what's going on with Jesus. But then something different happens. Like when you read the next verses here, you you read something that you don't really expect. And this is only found in Matthew and Mark. There's this whole conversation that's going on here by the bystanders. It says, and some of the bystanders, hearing it, and what is it referring to? Why have you forsaken me, right? L-O-I, L-O-I, Lama Sabachthani. When they heard this, what did they say? Behold, he is calling Elijah. And then it says that someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait! Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Now, this is kind of different for us. In our Western culture, we're like, what is this about? We just saw him on the cross. He's separated from God. And these people are saying he's calling down Elijah. But first of all, in the Jewish context, it's written in Malachi that during the last days that Elijah will appear, that he will be a part of that. 
And so when Jesus is on the cross and he's crying, right? Eloi, Eloi, Lama, Samvaktini, they hear him say, Elijah. And so when I look at this passage here, this is the question that I have is, okay, are these folks mocking him? But you have to understand something. This is towards the end of the life of Jesus. He's been on the cross for three hours. And before we read in Mark, we read about these, the religious leaders and the scribes, and they're encouraging the crowd to say, crucify him, crucify him. Uh, they're laughing at him, mocking him, saying, come down from the cross. But that was over three hours ago. So right now, here you have some bystanders. Some bystanders, they're standing there and they hear him say, Elijah. But he didn't say Elijah. He said, my God. And then in verse 36, somebody runs, right? You get this sense of urgency. Somebody runs, fills a sponge with sour wine, puts it on a reed and gives it to him to drink. And what do they say? Let us see whether Elijah will come take him down. Is it me or is this passage communicating concern and care for Jesus? Why would they want to give him something to drink if they were so adamantly opposed to him? When you look at the language, here's the interesting thing. How many people have been around people that are on their dying breath? Sometimes they're not coherent and sometimes their speech is not clear. Jesus was on the cross. He was pushing himself up to try to grab air to breathe. He says, Eloi, Eloi, Lombok Savaktini. Well, Eloi is Arabic. The L means God, L, and the OI is the personal my God, right? But there's also a similar word called Elias, or Eli, or Elias. And that means Elijah or Eli. And so it's possible that they heard him incorrectly. But they really think, let's preserve him, let's give him something because Elijah's going to come take him down. But Elijah didn't take him down. Because we read in this section here, and Jesus did what? He uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And this is what we call Good Friday. Because somehow Jesus is communicating to us that this is good. And we don't look at death as good. We're afraid of death. So he breathes his last breath, and then you're going to see like two miracles that happen here. One of them is that this, this curtain in verse 38 of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And a lot of people sometimes try to determine how thick the curtain was. And depending on what you read, some people will say that, at the, that you know, it was four inches. Some will say it was the size of a hand. There have been some books that have, commentators just said it was like 15 feet. But we never focus on the thickness. Mark doesn't focus on the thickness. What Mark focuses on is the height, right? Because he says the temple was torn what? The curtain from top to bottom. And so if you look at like in the, when Moses is constructing, and he's given these instructions to build the tabernacle, you see cubits there. And cubits, there's a debate about how big a cubit is. Most people think it's around... 18, right? 
And so it's possible that the tabernacle was 15 feet, the curtain 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet. Some say it was 20 feet by 20 feet by 20 feet. And some people say that during the time of Jesus, when Herod reconstructed this temple, he made it at a grander scale and it may have been as high as 60 feet. We don't know what the actual height is. But we do know that it was tall, right? Because it had to kind of, it separated the most holy place from the holy place. And the most holy place was where all the pri- only, only one priest a year could go through and he would make an atonement for himself in the sins of the people. And nobody else was permitted in there. He was there one time a year, right? And so in this instance, that curtain that separated the most holy place from the the holy, it was torn from top to bottom, indicating that we now have access to God, that we can come to God and we can pray. And, and Jesus is our mediator. He was the high priest. There's no more need for that. Top to bottom. And then verse 39, it says, And when the centurion who stood there facing him saw that he had breathed his last, what does he proclaim? Truly, this man is the Son of God. There was only one other human being in Scripture that referred to Jesus as the Son of God. There were demons, there was God the Father, there was even Jesus the Son, right? But the only person that refers to him as the Son of God was Peter. Remember in Caesarea? People were saying that, no, that's not Jesus, John the Baptist, or no, that's Elijah, right? And Jesus asked Peter this question, well, who do you say I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what was Jesus' response? You did not learn that from man. That was something that God gave you. And so in this instance, this is the second human that refers to Jesus as the Son of God. Some commentators have said, well, you know, the Romans referred to other people as the sons of God. But the interesting thing is the way this sentence is constructed, it's like of all the things that he's seen, of all the stories he's heard, he concludes truly this man is the Son of God. When I first became a Christian, about 1994, I know some of you weren't here, my friend used to bug me. He used to say, you know what, this is a miracle. It's not a miracle. I just have chosen to follow Christ. Far removed from that time, I realized that any time someone comes to Christ, it's a miracle. And this Roman, we don't know exactly what happened because we don't have the stories. We have some tradition that says that he became a Christian or that he, he was a Christian at this point. But I, I do know that the Roman centurion represents somebody that is this person that you would think would not have any kind of emotional connectivity to Jesus as being the Son of God. And there are people in your life, people that you know that say, I don't want to have anything to do with God. God's not real. Conversion is supernatural experience. It's a supernatural experience. This centurion sees Jesus breathe his last breath, and he concludes that this man was the Son of God. If you look at the book of Matthew, you see another miracle because there's actually a, an earthquake that happens. Uh, the rocks are split and the tombs are torn and you have Old Testament saints that come out here and they're resurrected. This is the death of Christ. The death of Christ does this. I, I want to I end by... 
talking about that comment that I made earlier. Remember when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was quoting Psalm 22, okay? If I were to die right here, and I said in my dying breath, the British are coming, what would go in your mind? Paul Revere, the midnight run. We know the story, right? I could just say the phrase, and you know the story. If I were to die right here, my last breath was, I have a dream. What would you think about? Martin Luther King, right? And you know beyond the phrase, I have a dream, what his dream was. And you know how that was played out, right? And so here is Jesus in front of a Jewish crowd that memorized Scripture, knew their Torah, and he utters the first phrase that would be as familiar to him as the British are coming to us. They would know the rest of the story. And so I want to invite Jacob here, uh, or you could sit there, what do you, whatever you prefer, to share Psalm 22 in its entirety so you know the whole story. Hello? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet, you are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword. My precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell you, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. For he is not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth 
eat and worship before him shall bow all who go down in the dust even the one who could not keep himself alive posterity shall serve him it shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it <clears throat> do you remember when Jesus first began his ministry he went into the temple and he was reading from the prophet Isaiah and he talked about the lame able to walk and the blind able to see and then he rolls up the scroll and he says today scripture has been fulfilled that was at the beginning of his ministry this is at the end he's basically reminding them of Psalm 22. And Psalm 22, I, I love a couple things about it. Number one, he says that God hears your cry. No matter what you're going through in life, you might not feel like he's responding or he's not showing you the kind of response you want, but it says he feels, he hears you. He doesn't turn away from you. And I love how the Psalm David, he, he says that we will worship him all nations. And then he ends in verse 39, he says, and they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. That's us. This Psalm is for us as well. That's the story. The story of, of Good Friday is that, yeah, Jesus died for our sins and is based out of that sacrificial love that Mike was talking about. But man, this psalm talks about the victory that, that Jesus was basically saying, I'm on the cross. I know you feel like I'm abandoned, but God hasn't forsaken me. He hears me. And he hears you as well. And there will be a day when the only thing that we will be able to do is just praise him for that. That's what Jesus on the cross signifies. It is good. It is finished. It is done. Your sins have been forgiven. I hope that encourages you to know the whole story behind that psalm. Let's pray. <clears throat>